This is the biggest and busiest railway station in East London, and it is none other than Stratford, a major multi-level railway station served by all kinds of public transport, with the London Underground, Overground, DLR, Elizabeth Line, and National Rail trains serving the station. Within this rail complex, there are also high-speed services, which depart from a separate station known as Stratford International. The station also houses two large bus stations, handling up to 24 routes combined. Stratford Station overall serves the Westfield Stratford Shopping Centre and a bright housing development known as Stratford City. Stratford even played a role as the key travel hub for the London Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2012, easily one of the most memorable times for sport in London. Overall, there is just so much happening here. And in this video, we'll find the hidden gems and trivia that can be found within Stratford that you walk past every day but never notice, as well as bits of history with the rail complex and the area overall. So let's explore the secrets of Stratford Station and its rail complex. In order to understand Stratford Station overall, we need to take a look at the history of the station first and how the operators arrived at the station too. Stratford Station first opened in June of 1839 by the Eastern Counties Railway, with the first station building being on Angel Lane. One year later, the Northern and Eastern Railway opened the line from Broxbourne to join the ECR at Stratford, running via Tottenham Hale. New station buildings were built in 1847, replacing the original structure on Angel Lane. These were located in the V between the Cambridge and Colchester lines, and access was via Station Road. The first line through the low-level platforms opened in 1846 as a goods-only branch as far as Thames Wharf. The London, Tilbury and South End Railway arrived at Stratford in 1854, after the construction of a junction near what is now Forest Gate Station on the Elizabeth Line. By 1855, there were links from both the low- and high-level stations to the North London Line, as well as the spur that enabled trains from Liverpool Street to head to North Woolwich, which had to avoid Stratford altogether. Services to Loughton commenced in August of 1856, with the line getting extended to Ongar in 1865. By the 1860s, the railways in East Anglia were in financial trouble, and most were leased to the ECR. They wished to amalgamate formally, but could not obtain government agreement for this until 1862, when the Great Eastern Railway was formed by amalgamation. Thus, Stratford became a GER station in 1862. In 1877, the station had a ton of improvements, which you can pause and read here. The Hainault Loop, formerly known as the Fairlop Loop, opened in 1903 and ran services from Liverpool Street around the loop going anti-clockwise before heading back to Liverpool Street. 20, 20 years later, the GER became a part of the LNER. When London Transport was formed and announced their new works program, one of their plans was to take over the former GER branches to Leytonstone, Hainault, Woodford, Epping and Ongar and make them a part of the London Underground Central Line and were opened between 1946 and 1949. The new Docklands Light Railway opened in August of 1987 and first ran from Stratford and Tower Gateway to Island Gardens. The low level of the station was completely overhauled in the 1990s as part of the Jubilee Line extension from Green Park to Stratford. A new station building was constructed, and it is easily a wonder of the station's aesthetic pleasure. Between 1997 and 2007, the North London Line was operated by Silverlink, owned by National Express, with their North London Line services operating between Richmond and North Woolwich, but the section between North Woolwich and Stratford closed in 2006, with the section to Canning Town being converted as a branch of the DLR to Stratford International, and this branch opened in 2011 in preparation for the Olympics. In 2007, again in preparation for the Olympics, Silverlink was disbanded and was taken over by TfL and London Overground, and the North London line was diverted to use two new platforms on the high level in 2009. TfL Rail started in 2015, as a temporary service to what would become the Elizabeth Line. And it opened in May of 2022, finally allowing you to get a train directly from Stratford to Heathrow. Now that we've covered a quick history of Stratford Station, 
Let's take a look at the 17 platforms that the operators serve, starting with the high-level platforms, which run east-west through the station. So platforms 1 and 2 are terminating platforms used for the London Overground's North London Line, and they operate services from Stratford to Richmond and Clapham Junction via Wilson Junction. Almost every Overground train leaves from these platforms, but in rare occasions, they can sometimes use platforms 11 and 12, and even platform 10A, and I was actually lucky enough to capture this rarity on film, as shown here. Platforms 3 and 6 are used for the London Underground Central Line, whose platforms are surfaced here between two tunnel portals, and I'll explain why later. Platform 6 handles eastbound trains to Newbury Park, Hainold, and Epping, and is a casual site platform, while Platform 3 handles westbound trains to White City, Ealing Broadway, and West Ryslip, and its platform was really odd because it has Spanish solution boarding. More on this later. Platform 4 is a terminating platform for DLR services from Lewisham and Canary Wharf that go via Poplar and Bow Church, but this platform is unusual because the platform is divided into 4A and 4B. More on this later. Platforms 5 and 8 are used by the Elizabeth Line, with Platform 5 handling all westbound trains to Paddington and Heathrow, and Platform 8 handling all eastbound trains to Gidea Park and Shenfield. These platforms are even served by C2C services to Southend and Shoebury Ness from their secondary terminus at Liverpool Street, but their services are only seen at Stratford on weekends because their flagship terminus is at London Fenchurch Street. Platforms 9 and 10 are used for national rail services operated by Greater Anglia. These platforms serve trains heading up along the Great Eastern Main Line to places like Colchester, Southend via Shenfield, Clacton on Sea, Norwich, etc. The aforementioned Platform 10A acts as a bypass platform to Platform 10, and is mainly used by freight trains accessing the Great Eastern Main Line. Platforms 11 and 12 are also served by Greater Anglia, but these platforms serve trains starting from Stratford that head up to Meridian Water and Bishop Stortford via Tottenham Hale that run on the West Anglia Main Line. Now with the high-level platforms done, let's move down to the low-level platforms, which run perpendicular to the high level. Platforms 13, 14 and 15 are terminating platforms, and they act as the eastern terminus of the London Underground Jubilee Line, who operate services from Stratford, via the Docklands, South Bank and the West End, all the way up to Stanmore in northwest London. Finally, we have platforms 16 and 17, and these platforms cater for DLR services to Stratford International, London City Airport and Woolwich Arsenal, and these were the former Platforms 1 and 2 until 2009. The first secret is the naming convention, because it seems really baffling. There is currently this Stratford in London, but there is also a Stratford on the banks of the River Avon in Warwickshire, called Stratford-upon-Avon. So the station is sometimes known as Stratford-London, with the London suffix in brackets to distinguish it from Stratford-upon-Avon. But to further complicate this mess, the station is sometimes known as Stratford Regional to distinguish it from Stratford International. And the evidence of the station being called Stratford Regional can be found on multiple signposts within Stratford International. As you approach the station from the southeast, off to your right hand side, you'll find a large tree structure known as the Stratford Shoal. This 250 meter long structure conceives a series of tree like forms with steel branches and oversized titanium leaves. The leaf panels are anodized to display shades of green and yellow, and each one is fixed on pivots, allowing them to concurrently move with the wind. On the opposite side of the Stratford Shoal, you'll notice that there is a 38-ton 060 saddle tank engine, and it has the nameplate Robert mounted on its boiler. This tank engine was built in Bristol in 1933, and was used by the Lamport Ironstone Mines Railway in Northamptonshire. Then it was moved to Heritage Railways in Buckinghamshire, Staffordshire and Derbyshire, 
before being bought by the LDDC in 1993. He moved to Becton in 1994, but due to vandalism, he was recited and placed right outside Stratford Station in 1999. In 2008, Robert was sent to the East Anglia Railway Museum in Colchester for restoration, and returned to Stratford in time for the Olympics, in what can only be described as a softer legacy benefit of the Olympic Games. The Stratford bus station opened in 1994 and was designed by London transport architect Sojia Bates, and it incorporates five bus stands, serving 14 regular bus routes and three night bus routes. The bus station also houses one of the station's taxi racks. The bus station was built on an older bus station on the site, which was located on the ground floor of a multi-storey car park, but sadly, nothing remains of the old car park today. Entering the station and going past the main gate line, there is a direct link to only one platform, and that is platform 17. To access the Jubilee line, passengers will have to go up an escalator, walk along the sky bridge, and then go down again via another escalator to access the Jubilee Line platforms. The reason being is because the Stratford International DLR platforms block direct access between both concourses. I'll explain what this escalator has in its special character later. The high-level platforms are accessible from the main gate line by this underpass, and this other underpass, here, connects the Jubilee Line to the high-level platforms. These underpasses have a tendency to get crowded, especially at rush hour, not to mention that the width and height of these corridors are far too small, and I think it really deserves an upgrade. This escalator here is really special, because this is the shortest escalator on the whole tube network, being at 4.1 meters. This is also a rare place on the tube where you can take an escalator up to an underground line platform. But the direction of the two escalators here change at certain times of the day. Okay, so I'm going to time this escalator down here. And this is the shortest escalator on the whole tube network. So I'm going to start the timer now. 22 seconds. So the escalator which I went down, which was this one, um, only beats Chancery Lane on the central line uh, by a few inches. That's cool. If you walk along the sky bridge above the low-level concourse, off to your right-hand side, you'll find a memorial plaque which commemorates the Stratford tube crash in 1953, when a central line train had stopped at a damaged signal in the tunnel between Stratford and Leighton. But the driver of the train was oblivious to the fact that the signal had been damaged and assumed that there was a train close in front, and then the train behind collided with the stationary train, killing 12 people and injuring 46. This was the worst tube crash on the underground until the Moorgate crash in 1975. The plaque was unveiled in 2016. If you stand on the westbound central line platform, you'll notice that there are two platforms for the westbound trains, and one of the platforms is more modern than the original. This new platform is known as Platform 3A. Construction started on this platform in 2008, and some of the existing glass panels in the station building had to be knocked down to create new walkways to the new platform. The new platform opened in September of 2010 to take pressure off of the existing platform and the underpasses that led to Platform 3. Another benefit of this platform is to allow for easier access between the westbound Central Line and the Jubilee Line, and you can actually see the Jubilee Line trains if you stand at the western end of the platform. When the Central Line trains arrive on the westbound platform, the doors on both sides of the train open, and this strategy is known as Spanish Solution Boarding. And it can be found at several other stations on the underground. Here is a demonstration of it occurring at Stratford.
terrifying trains pop out of the tunnel from White City and into Stratford. But when they depart Stratford, they dive into another tunnel and then emerge out of the second tunnel to arrive at Leighton. And the opposite is true heading westbound. The reason why the central line surfaces at Stratford and then dives again is to allow for cross-platform interchange with the Elizabeth line. The westbound platform crossing is platforms 3 to 5, and it is 6 to 8 for the eastbound platform crossing, and this is in the same direction for both directions. And the reason why there is a tunnel between Stratford and Leighton is to avoid the G-Mill and HS1 tracks, and I would really like to add a station here between Stratford and Leighton known as Cobham Farm to better serve the East Village, but this would involve having to rebuild the tunnel, something that is ludicrously expensive. If you stand on the high-level platforms often, you'll notice that there is a bridge that spans the full length of the 11 tracks of the high level. This is known as the Stratford Town Centre Link, and it connects the Stratford bus station to the Westfield Stratford City and to Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And this bridge is used by hundreds, if not thousands of shoppers every single day. The bridge, along with Westfield Stratford City, opened in September of 2011, and the bridge alone was designed by Knight Architects, and they designed this 130 meter bridge to be gently curved in plan. The inner core of the truss is warped so that it is inclined to 15 degrees at mid-span. The careful use of weathering steel brings a sophisticated, urban appearance and simplifies maintenance over the 11 tracks. From this bridge, you can get a good view of the high-level station down below. A lot of you will be familiar with the two subways that connect the low-level concourse with the high-level, but there is a third subway in the station, and this is located to the east of the high-level, and was previously abandoned, but in preparation for the development of Stratford City, the subway was refurbished and reopened, and it connects to the middle subway at its northern end here. Meanwhile, the two existing subways were extended to a brand new station entrance on the north side, and this entrance is right next to one of the entrances to the Westfield Shopping Centre, and all of this opened in 2011. This entrance also leads to where the second bus station is, the confusingly named Stratford City Bus Station. This bus station opened again in 2011 as part of the Westfield Shopping Centre, and it's also where coaches stop as well, that take passengers to destinations up north like Stansted Airport. Six bus routes and one night bus route call here. So um, we're currently standing on the Greater Anglia platforms um, for the Great Eastern Main Line here at Stratford. And um, an odd fact about um, the this set of platforms is that um, this face here, which is now platform nine, used to not previously exist. Um, because originally there, were, there used to be only two platforms for the uh, Great Eastern trains that, which are operated by Greater Anglia. So it was this one here, which is now platform 10, formerly number 9, and then that one there, which is now 10A, formerly platform 10. And um, the reason being, um, the reason why there are three platforms here um, is because um, back in the 1990s, um, the old station buildings on um, this, pla this island platform here um, was um, demolished to make way for a new face which is right here. So um, this became number 9, um, this one became platform 10, and then the old platform 10 became platform 10A. So um, are you actually confused um, of what I said there? Um, uh, that, that is perfectly fine and I'm quite confused by this too. So we're on Stratford platform 11 and you notice how the platform extends so far into the, um, into the abyss there. Um, or not really an abyss, but um, so if you like stand there, you're actually more closer to Stratford International rather than the main Stratford station building. Um, and also because the tracks actually cross above the HS1 trench. Um, and if you um, like stand there and like wait at the perfect moment for a Eurostar train to pass, you can sometimes hear the rumble of Eurostar trains in the trench. So, yeah, that is quite amazing. If you stand at the western end of platforms 5 and 8, you'll notice that there are two abandoned bays here, right next to what are now the westbound and eastbound Elizabeth Line platforms. And this is the secret where I explain why I skipped platform 7 in the platform segment earlier in the video and why the Canary Wharf DLR platforms are split into 4A and 4B. 
So back in the 1940s, when the main line to Shenfield was electrified, there was an intention to run a shuttle service from Fenchurch Street to Stratford, calling it Stepney, now Limehouse, and Bow Road. But this Bow Road was an older station located on a piece of track known as the Bow Curve, not the modern-day Bow Road Tube Station. Despite having everything ready, the shuttle service never materialised. The reason why is unknown. So these platforms remained obsolete until 1987, when one of the bays, that being Platform 4, was used as the terminus platform for the DLR, while Platform 7 remained abandoned. After 20 years, Platform 4 was abandoned again, and the DLR moved to new platforms south of the old platform, designated as 4A and 4B in 2007. These platforms are not accessed by any of the subways, but through a separate entrance on the upper level of the main concourse right here, and these can also be accessed from the westbound Elizabeth Line platform via this footbridge. Beside the aforementioned entrance is this artwork piece, created by Barbie Ascent. Now let's talk about the station building, because this makes up the main aspect of why the station is impressive. Back in 1994, during the construction of the Jubilee Line extension, the station was in need of a rebuild as the original was really dilapidated. The new station building was designed by Wilkinson Air to define a striking identity for the Jubilee Line extension. The building is an elegantly curved roof swooping up to a suspended glass wall. When passengers arrive into the station, they are bathed in natural light. Sustainability was key behind the design, so much so that the building was among the first of this scale and kind to be entirely passively ventilated. The curved roof is the optimum shape required to enable solar-assisted natural ventilation via a void in the roof through which air is drawn by the stack effect created as the sun heats the outer layer. This natural ventilation maintains air movement and keeps summer temperatures at comfortable levels. It also provides smoke ventilation should a fire occur in the concourse. The impressive steel and glass structure has retained its elegance over 20 years after completion. But, unfortunately, TFL and Network Rail have crudely decided to demolish the current station building and assemble a new one in the same location. I personally disagree with this plan, because it would just ruin the sanctity of Stratford, and because the current building is much better in my opinion. But I do understand that it will help relieve congestion and provide new transit-oriented developments. So, um, do you know about the Stratford station upgrade, which TFL and Network Rail have crudely decided to propose? Um, well, rather than actually building it on the main side, which is that way, um, I actually want it to be built here instead. Um, um, and, like, even though they are just deciding to build a globe here, which I back off with, uh, um, but, um, basically, there would be a station building here with, um, TFL and Greater Anglia maps um, and Greater Anglia ticket machines sprinkled inside this new booking hall. Um, and um, outside, um, there would be the... Um, all of the coach and taxi stands would be moved outside of the new building. But, um, just, like, you know, to better um, enhance connectivity from the north side. Um, and also, um, the reason why I want the new station building to be put here instead um, is because there is nothing here at the moment. If you gaze up at the glass of the current building, the view behind you is reflected onto the glass panels. Through the glass, you can see the main bus station on one side and the Stratford International DLR and the Jubilee Line platforms on the other. Speaking of the Jubilee Line, this is where the next batch of secrets are. The first one is that back in the early 2000s, there used to be a gate line that led to the Jubilee Line platforms. But when Oyster was rolled out on all national rail services in London, and when the DLR opened to Stratford International, this gate line was demolished. The reason why they installed it in the first place is because Silverlink was completely separate from the Oyster network, not to mention that the Silverlink platforms were right next to the Jubilee line. Now let's talk about service frequency. The Jubilee line has three platforms in Stratford, but platforms 14 and 15 have more trains throughout the day than Platform 13. That is why there is a poster that says that there are no trains on this platform between 720 and 2300. And um, these stairs here um, connect you to a footbridge which connects Platform 13 with 14 and 15.
and it's right adjacent to the um, uh, Stratford International DLR line here, and also the bus station on the other side. Despite the station being massive, it only has three entrances, but it's set to get a fourth one next year. Alongside Platform 13, you'll notice that there are blue hoardings. This is because a new southwestern entrance is being constructed, which will improve access to the Carpenters Estate, avoiding residents for having to take this footbridge and then approaching the station from the southeast. The Jubilee Line platforms are the only place where you can find proper roundels inside the gate line. All other signs are just rectangular with either the usual DLR sign or more unusually, a plain sign with only a colored bar corresponding to the line, which is what you can see on the high level platforms. Behind the Jubilee Line platforms is Stratford Market Depot, the main depot for the Jubilee Line and was also designed by Wilkinson Air. Construction began in 1994 with archaeological excavations uncovering evidence of Stratford Langthorne Abbey, as well as 674 graves. The depot fully opened in March of 1998 and was named after a former fruit and vegetable market that used to occupy the site. You can see the depot if you travel on a Jubilee Line train between West Ham and Stratford. Many years ago, if you arrived at Stratford on a Jubilee Line train, you would have noticed that the announcement was quite tiny, even with new services arriving at the station. But with the opening of the Elizabeth Line, TfL finally updated the announcements on the 96 stock. I will show you both the old and new announcements now. The next station is Stratford. Change for the Central Line, DLR and National Rail Services. The next station is Stratford. Change for the Central Line, DLR, Elizabeth, London Overground and National Rail Services. Many of you will be familiar with Stratford and Stratford International, but there is a third station having the suffix of Stratford that being Stratford High Street on the DLR, and I timed the journey from Stratford. It takes about 1 minute and 5 seconds. This station opened in 2011 on the extension to Stratford International, and the thing that makes the station special is that this station still has an old station building, which was part of the old Stratford Market Station that was located on the same site as Stratford High Street. That old station closed in 1957. If I peek over this bridge and look that way, you can see Stratford Station in the distance if you're standing um, right in front of Stratford High Street. And if um, this actually symbolizes how close the two stations are. The next secret involves with the London Overground. As you travel on the train between Hackney Wick and Stratford, you will hear a lie in the PA system. Just take a listen. The next station is the PA system indirectly mentions Stratford International, but that part is wrong because all Eurostar trains bypass Stratford International, and Stratford still has an ongoing lifelong dream of having international services once and for all. Speaking of Stratford International, this is a smooth segue into the next topic of this video. Now let's board this DLR train and head north to Stratford International. So as the train leaves Stratford, it goes under the high-level platforms and this can be distinguished by a cantilever and some handrails visible from the London Overground platforms. The train then goes through this curving tunnel with the Westfield Shopping Centre right above before emerging into the open to run close to the North London line. Then it splits away from it to run alongside a freight line. Then the train goes above the HS1 trench before diving into the DLR's own trench before arriving into Stratford International DLR station where the service from Woolwich Arsenal terminates. So um, this secret is, um, was first mentioned in um, the 2019 secrets of the DLR. Um, so when um, the people come out of Stratford International DLR, they hit up these escalators here, which take you up to the shopping center and the National Rail Stratford International. But 
there's actually a back entrance that way, um, which heads um, up to some up to the Olympic Village. Uh, from this back entrance, you'll notice a tunnel which goes under the East Village. This carries a freight line and is used to allow freight trains to run between the Great Eastern and West Anglia main lines without having to reverse at Stratford. This freight line also connects with the North London line via this triangular junction. Now let's talk about the biggest white elephant in the room, Stratford International. The Channel Tunnel opened in 1994 and connects Calais in France with Folkestone in England and connected to a high-speed line in France known as the LGV Nord, which connects the Channel Tunnel with Paris Gare du Nord, which in turn has connections with the Paris Metro, RER and Transilien services. When Eurostar trains would arrive in the UK, they used the classic southeastern lines into Waterloo International. This was odd for a true high-speed train, and it made the UK bit of Eurostar feel super underwhelming. So a new dedicated high-speed line was needed, and it was none other than HS1, which opened in stages between 2003 and 2007, that connected the Channel Tunnel to St Pancras, which got turned from a dark fumed station in the 90s to a brighter, more elegant station in 2007. Stratford International was built on the new line, but Eurostar didn't want to stop there for a multitude of reasons. Eurostar claimed that transport from the station and a connection between Stratford International and the main Stratford station was inadequate, not even the DLR station here. So the bit between the two feels pointless because you can just walk between the two stations through the shopping center, so I actually want this branch of the DLR to extend to the suburb of Aldersbrook from Stratford International, with intermediate stations at Cranfield Road, Canhall Park and Wanstead Flats. But it was hoped that Eurostar would stop at Stratford International temporarily for the Olympics and Paralympics in 2012. But once again, it never happened. But the main reason was the journey time from St Pancras, which is only seven minutes. So Eurostar threw away their plans to stop at Stratford International, with the exception of a few of them. The first one involves with the Olympics. To understand, we need to take a look at how the Olympics came to London. The winning bid for the Olympics is announced seven years before the game start, but a few years before it's announced, many cities put forward their bids, but they need to accept if they have relevant numbers of crowds, including athletes and support crew, suitable accommodation, security, venues, and good transport links. When the city passes an audit, it is considered to be a candidate city. Then the city pays an acceptance fee of $150,000 to the International Olympic Committee. Then when the final city bid is announced, the venues are constructed for the events. Since the Olympics were announced to be held in London, there had to be international appeal on Stratford, and the only facilities nearby that were international were Stratford International and HS1. The second plan is on Eurostar, because they had one sole plan to save Stratford International's purpose, Regional Eurostar. This was a plan to have Eurostar services call at Birmingham, Manchester, Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, Edinburgh and Glasgow, all across the UK, before running all the way to continental Europe. Stratford International was built for these services instead. Even with the Eurostar facility being constructed in Manchester, it was unlikely to happen. Due to criticism over the current climate, journey times, etc., and even with the proposed link between HS1 and HS2, this plan never happened and the hope for Stratford International never took off and remained elusive. But what we got instead were the Class 395 Javelin services by Southeastern High Speed. These trains connect commuters on a faster route between Kent, Medway and Central London via HS1. A new Eurostar depot near Stratford International opened, and this is accessed by a track and tunnel that curve to the northeast. And this depot replaced the old North Pole International depot in Alder Common. The new depot can be seen if you travel on a Greater Anglia service towards Tottenham Hale. Surprisingly, hope for Stratford International's purpose is still on the horizon. Back in 2010, Deutsche Bahn proposed a service from London to Frankfurt via Stratford International using the 406 ICE 3M units, but this never materialised due to changes in the economy. 
Renfe was quite interested in running a Spain to London service because it was viable and profitable for Renfe to compete with Eurostar. Remember when I said took off earlier? This is because from the 1990s, flights have been getting very cheap, and this was getting affordable to some people rather than clean and green trains. Shocking, isn't it? To finish off, there are a few secrets hidden around the station. The area which incorporates Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, Westfield and Stratford International used to be Stratford Depot, a huge maintenance yard close to the Great Eastern Main Line, allowing steam and diesel engines to rest after they brought their trains. But this depot lasted until 1997, when significant redevelopment work started to have a shopping centre, Stratford International and the Olympic Park. There is a plaque in the station which marks its old location. There is also this passageway from the ground floor of the Westfield Shopping Centre to a back entrance of Stratford International. And this back entrance is also where you'll find these loading docks with large numbers on top. This exists to allow trucks to bring in goods and to unload them for Westfield. You can also still see the long dormant Eurostar platforms with its paint continuing to rot. So, this is why you have a lifeless, dormant, high-speed international list station in one of the busiest metropolitan centres in the UK. But who knows? With the recent merger between Eurostar and Talis, and the recent announcement of Eurostar serving more European destinations, one day, maybe Eurostar will finally solidify Stratford International's purpose, once and for all. So, that is Stratford Station, and it's many secrets and trivia for you to discover. The amount of lore present in this area is monumental. I was really passionate to love this area and its transport after the Olympics came and went, and even still after the years glided on. From dull, gloomy wasteland to Olympic thriving centre, from regional to international hub, Stratford has really been through a successful but rocky journey. This has been a very long video, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe for more content, and see you next time.